Welcome to Amici, News and Insights from the New York Courts. I'm John Carr, and I am pleased and honored to welcome to this diversity dialogue segment, Supreme Court Justice Joanne D. Quinones of Brooklyn. Justice Quinones was first appointed to the bench in 2010 by Mayor Michael Bloomberg, elevated to acting Supreme Court Justice in 2017, and confirmed by the New York State Senate in 2022 as a judge of the New York State Court of Claims. In 2023, she was elected to the Supreme Court. A graduate of Brown University and Fordham University School of Law, Justice Quinones serves on the Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission, the Advisory Committee on Judicial Ethics, and also serves as chair of the Second Judicial District's Equal Justice Committee. Justice Quinones is a champion of mentoring programs and every year takes on scores of young people as interns and, and mentees for what is affectionately known as Camp Quinones. She frequently speaks on issues of diversity, inclusion, and the elimination of bias. Judge, thank you for coming on the program. Your public record is obviously public. Today, I'd like to delve a little deeper to understand the woman behind the robe. So let's let's turn the clock back a little bit. Where were you born? Um, so where was I born? Okay, so I was born in the Bushwick neighborhood of Brooklyn, and I'm not talking about the hip, cool, it place, Bushwick of today. I'm talking about the Bushwick of the 70s, you know, the very poor Bushwick that no one wanted to be near, no one wanted to visit, no one wanted to live there. Um, and nowadays, miraculously, you know, it's really come into its own. There are buses filled with tourists making stops all over Bushwick. Everyone wants to live there now, you know, so that's where I grew up. But it was the Bushwick of the 70s, very poor, um, drug ridden, unfortunately, lots of abandoned homes, that sort of thing. Well, what, what was life like for you as a kid growing up in Bushwick um, in, I guess, in, in the 70s? The neighborhood was mostly Black and Latino. Um, the Latinos were mostly Puerto Ricans. Um, afterwards, it evolved, right? There were some Dominicans. There were some Asian families that came into Bushwick. Um, then lots of Central American Latinos. Um, when I was growing up there, there was also a very big Muslim presence in the neighborhood. There was a mosque right on Bushwick Avenue, just a, a couple of blocks away from my elementary school. So, you know, we went to school with the Muslim children who lived in the Muslim community. They would come together, you know, they would be escorted to school as a group and they were in our classes and stuff. As an adult, right, I've read a lot and, you know, about Bushwick and, you know, the changes and all that other stuff. And I also came across all of these like stories and articles. And um, I believe that even Jacqueline Woodson wrote a book about the many arson fires in Bushwick in the 70s, but I don't have any independent recollection of that. The only thing that I remember vividly from like the 70s and growing up in Bushwick was the blackout of 1977. I remember like sitting on the front stoop with my family because, you know, everything was dark inside. So we were like outside with like groups of people or what have you and like hearing and kind of seeing what was going on, you know, the looting, the people like, you know, trying to, you know, like basically just, you know, spending time in the street because it was so dark and everyone just didn't want to be indoors kind of thing. But it sounds like you had a multicultural education just by virtue of where you lived. Absolutely, absolutely, definitely. Latino, Black, Muslims, Asians, you know, and most of my teachers were white. So, you know, I grew up in a very like multicultural kind of school, I would say, you know, my neighborhood was mostly Black and Latino, but in school I was exposed to everyone else. How does that shape you, do you think? I think it definitely made me the person I am today, right? Like, one, I grew up in a very, very Latino, very, very proud Puerto Rican uh, family, right? So I am fiercely proud of being Puerto Rican. I don't know if you um, heard or saw anything about my induction, but the ceremonial unit, one of them carried a Puerto Rican flag. There was also a second Puerto Rican flag. I walked into a salsa song that talked about, you know, being born and raised in Puerto Rico. But, you know, growing up in a neighborhood where there were so many different people really made me more attuned to people, right, to our differences, our similarities. It made me more sensitive to, like, people's unique situations. And really kind of made me the person that I am today who's so committed to like diversity and equity and inclusion. Now tell me about your parents. So my mother was employed with the Brooklyn Public Library and uh, she was the disciplinarian and the driving force in our home. <laughs> my dad uh, worked at a factory and he often worked double shifts and arrived home long after like we had gone to bed. Both my parents were born in Puerto Rico. They came to New York as youth. Uh, my dad like 
at age 10 and my mom as a teenager. Both of my parents really stressed the importance of education and were very encouraging of my educational and extracurricular pursuits, you know, whether it was the prep for prep program, which is was an educational and leadership program for students of color that I was accepted into at about age 11, or whether it was my ballet classes, you know, because I thought I was going to be like some great ballerina one day. <laughs> um, but they truly like made me believe that I could be anything that I wanted to be. And it sounds like they also instilled quite the work ethic. Yes, absolutely. As they were hard workers, very hard workers. Were, who, who were your major childhood role models? Was it your parents or others? Well, certainly my mother. I mean, my mother is this strong and independent woman. She always was. Um, I simultaneously admired her and feared her. Like I said, she was a disciplinarian. My dad was not. And, you know, my teachers, my teachers took a real interest in me and encouraged me to do my very best. And uh, I loved and still love Wonder Woman. <laughs> I remember watching her on TV. You know, she was this fiercely independent woman warrior. She lived on an island that was inhabited and governed by women only. So I love everything Wonder Woman. In fact, my entire office is decorated in like Wonder Woman memorabilia. Oh, that's great. That is wonderful. <laughs> so at, at Brown University, I, I think you were a pre-med student uh, before you decided to switch gears and become a lawyer. What caused that switch? What, what attracted you to the practice of law? I think it was more what repelled me from the pre-med field. <laughs> you know, as a senior, I was taking organic chemistry. And for some reason, you know, I didn't get along with Orgo. Orgo didn't get along with me. So I dropped the class. Um, it was actually the last prerequisite that I needed to complete for my pre-med requirements or what have you. So I was very, very far along. Um, and what I knew was, you know, once I figured out that med school wasn't going to be the right track for me, because, you know, I didn't want to go to like that first year of med school dealing with blood. I'm, I can't even give blood without having a, you know, <laughs> fainting at the side of it. But um, I knew that I wanted to work with children. So I went to law school with the hope that I could become a child advocate. You know, my dream job throughout law school was either, you know, the Children's Defense Fund in Washington, D.C., or the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Division here in the city. But, you know, one has to be flexible. And when opportunity knocks, you answer the door. So, you know, last year at Fordham Law School, I was offered a position as a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Criminal Defense Division. So I took it. And, well, the rest is history, because, as you know, in my 13 plus years as a judge, I've mostly presided over criminal matters. Now, you, you were, I imagine, in college by the time that Carmen beauchamp Superic became the first Hispanic ever appointed to the Court of Appeals back in 1993, which really isn't all that long ago. Today, there are two judges, Jenny Rivera and Michael Garcia, the chief administrative judge, the Honorable Joseph Zayas, has roots in Puerto Rico. What can we say about the progress that has been made? And what can we say about the mountains left to climb? Clearly, progress has been made, right? Had, like you said, you know, now three people who have served on the Court of Appeals of Latino descent, we have the chief administrative judge, the first ever Latino serving in that position. Um, we've had two Latinos serve as, you know, presiding judges of the presiding justices of the appellate division first department. We have currently a Latino presiding justice of the second department. Recently, there were more Latinos appointed to the appellate division in the first, the second. So we certainly made some progress. I still think that, you know, we have a long, long way to go there. Um, the number of Latino judges, much like the number of La Asian judges, you know, is still very, very small in comparison to our populations in New York City and New York State as a whole. The number of Latino male judges is very, very, you know, low. And, you know, I just like I said, I just got inducted as a Supreme Court justice. And at my induction, I didn't realize, you know, I was talking about how people need role models, right? Like, and you can't be what you can't see, which is something that Marion Wright Edelman said, who's the founder of the Children's Defense Fund. And I never believed that I could become a Supreme Court judge in Brooklyn because there were no Latinas in that role. It wasn't until 1997, the year I graduated from law school, that the first Latina was elected to the Supreme Court in Brooklyn. And that was the Honorable Betsy Barros, who now sits at the Appellate Division Second Department. But to date, I mean, the number of Latinos who have been elected to either civil court or Supreme Court in Brooklyn, which is where I live, so that's what I'm most familiar with, is very, very, very minuscule. I mean, sad to say. 
So we definitely mm -hmm. have a lot more to do in order to like even the playing field, if you will. Did you say the numbers are particularly low for Hispanic males? Yes, yes, and I think black men as well. I mean, nowadays, most of the people who are being elected are women in New York City, at least. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any judicial role models either in New York or uh, nationally? I considered the judge for whom I served as a court attorney for, I was his court attorney for 10 years, the Honorable Matthew Cooper, who's now retired. Um, I consider him a role model. You know, I've often said that by by giving me the opportunity and the privilege to serve as his court attorney, Judge Cooper opened doors for me that I never anticipated work, you know, walking through. Like he definitely like gave me access to a system and court system that before then I had little to no access to, um, even as a, an attorney, at, you know, with the Legal Aid Society and whatnot. Judge Cooper really like took me under his wing. He let me see it all. He taught me uh, what a judge should do, what a judge should not do. Kidding, he was great. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the consummate wise Latina, is somebody like I look up to. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, who's the first African American woman um, and the first former public defender to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, is um, somebody I look up to as well. You know, I admire them both because you know they're trailblazers. I admire them for their commitment to inspiring youth and encouraging future generations of lawyers and judges. And I admire them, quite frankly, for the unapologetic, unapologetic way that they stand by the importance of diverse perspectives in the judiciary. Especially in terms of lived and life experiences, it's equally as important as, you know, diversity in terms of like racial, ethnic, ethnic lines and gender lines and that sort of thing. What do you mean by that? Meaning that, you know, for a long time, people who were former public defenders weren't being considered for judicial roles, right? Like it was mostly people who were former prosecutors or people who were in private practice. And I think that, you know, when we're talking about diversity, diversity in terms of lived and life experiences is equally as important, you know, like people who have been public defenders have a real unique perspective on the legal system, you know, particularly the criminal justice system, and are particularly attuned, um, I think, to, you know, safeguarding people's protectional, uh, I'm sorry, particularly attuned to safeguarding people's constitutional rights. You know, we're not just talking, I'm not saying that the prosecutors aren't or former prosecutors aren't, but I'm saying that, you know, that's something it's, that- It's a different, it's coming from a different perspective. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's just two, two people can be in a courtroom and see the same thing unfold, but they're looking at it from a different lens. Correct. You put it so nicely. That's exactly what I was trying to say. <laughs> well, thank you. And that that type of diversity is important. So in addition to your uh, day job, which I think keeps you extremely busy, you have all kinds of extracurriculars. Uh, Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission, the Judicial Ethics Committee, Equal Justice Committee. You've been involved with many other organizations. I think you were the first Latino ever to serve as presiding as a presiding member of the New York State Bar Association's judicial section, which is remarkable. You're a past president of the Latino Judges Association, Brooklyn Women's Bar Association. You served on boards of the National Association for Women Judges, the Women's Bar Association of the state of New York. Why do you do all this stuff? Well, I will just say that I was the first Latina to serve as presiding member of the New York State Bar Association's judicial section. 20 years prior, there was a Latino who had served as presiding member of that section. So in the 100 years that that section had been around, two of us. So why have I been so involved in those activities? You know, I guess it's because to me, being a judge is not just about what you do in the courthouse on the bench, but also about what you do in the community off the bench. So, you know, I make time for what's important to me. And what's important to me is to be actively involved in organizations that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, to be, you know, an active participant of organizations that are concerned with access to justice issues and to improving the court's relationship with the community. Some people always joke about, you know, like that I never sleep. And I was like, well, you know, you have to make time for what's important to you. So if that means I have to cut down on some sleep, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> that's great. And tell me about one particularly special program, particular special program you have, Camp Quinones. Camp Quinones. You know, Camp Quinones is one of my proudest and most gratifying community experience. I should say that, you know, 
the name Camp Quinone is in something I came up with. Um, you know, every year I take anywhere from eight to 15 interns ranging in level from high school to law school, the occasional middle schooler, so that they can kind of see firsthand the ins and outs of our justice system. In the summer is when I have the most interns at any one time. You know, they usually range anywhere between five to like 10 interns. So one summer um, I had about six interns and I was going into the supervising judge's office to pick up my chamber's mail. And, you know, my six interns kind of like were following behind me, almost like a little school of fish, right? So as we were walking into the supervising judge's office, one of the secretaries remarked, here comes Camp Quinones, and the name stuck. So <laughs> that's how we got the name Camp Quinones. And every summer I host a reunion for Camp Quinones alumni. And, you know, it's a way for them to catch up with one another, an opportunity to share ideas and resources, a means to inspire and encourage one another. Um, during COVID, we held the uh, Camp Quinones reunion via Zoom, um, but now we're back to in-person meetings. Um, and, you know, even throughout the year, we all stay in touch. Like I text them regularly. They share their accomplishments, their hardships, their ups and downs. They share graduation pictures. But, you know, for me, Camp Quinones highlights the power of mentorship, you know, the, the importance of pipelines. And, you know, my Camp Quinones alums really give me great hope for the future of our nation. And I just feel so honored and privileged to have, you know, played even but a small role in their development. I guess more than a small role, but any particularly inspiring stories from any of your, your mentees? You know, I, I think all of my mentees have inspiring stories. I think each of them is a unique and amazing person who has enhance my life in, you know, so many different ways. But I will say that, you know, I have been, I was involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters as a big sister um, since, I'm going to say like the early 2000s. And I had one mentee uh, who was being raised by her paternal aunt. Um, her dad had been incarcerated. Her mom had basically abandoned her. And then I, and she was 11 when I met her. And then I had another mentee, um, who was 13 at the time. Both of them, and I'm talking about early 2000, had expressed an interest in becoming a lawyer. The 13-year-old is now a practicing attorney in New York and New Jersey, and the 11-year-old, the then 11-year-old, now grown person, <laughs> is a paralegal currently enrolled in law school. Wow. So it, I'm very, it, very thrilled to, you know, see that they've come full circle, that they've reached, you know, where they wanted to be, and I hope that, you know, They'll join me as lawyers and later join me on the bench as judges. I can see the joy in your face as you tell <laughs> me that story. And and that brings me back to something you said a second ago that I immediately picked up on in my antenna went up. You talked about the program and how it enhanced your life. Yeah, because, you know, like so many people think that, you know, in a mentoring relationship, that the mentor gives, right? But the mentor gets just as much as the mentor gives, maybe even more so. I never let the young people know that, you know, that I need them so much more than they probably need me. But honestly, they like energize me. They give me such hope, you know? I see them and I get excited seeing life all over again through their eyes. That is truly beautiful. Now, in an essay you wrote for the New York Law Journal last year, you wrote, and I quote, for judges, this is not only a time of personal reflection and resolution, but also a time to reflect on the role our courts play in the lives and our justice system. What do you mean by that? Jeez, John, you really did a deep dive on me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was a reporter for 30 years. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I wrote that at the beginning of a new calendar year, you know, at a time when all of us, judges and non-judges, reflect back on the good, the bad, and the ugly of the past year. And, you know, we make hopeful promises as we look forward to the new year. And I remember that when I wrote that, our Supreme Court, as in the Supreme Court of the United States, had just issued um, their decision on Dobbs v. Jackson, and we were all awaiting a decision on the, um, the affirmative action, the Student for Fair Admissions uh, against Harvard and UNC. So I think that by saying that, what I was trying to say, I was really trying to emphasize the, the magnitude of the role of judges and that, you know, how important it is for us to be mindful of the decisions we make and the wide ranging and long standing impacts that our decisions can have on multitudes of people. So that was just kind of my way of like emphasizing that point. 
Mm, you did it very nicely. Now, <laughs> over the past year, there have been, as you would well know, huge administrative change in New York court, starting, of course, with the appointment of Rowan Wilson as a chief judge. What are your thoughts about the state court system and the direction that is heading under this new administration? Upwards and onwards. <laughs> no, really. I mean, I am so, so excited about the future of our courts under this leadership team. You know, at my induction, again, I had, um, I said, you know, they spoke. I had Judge, Chief Judge Wilson spoke, Chief Administrative Judge Saez, Deputy Chief Administrative Judge uh, Richardson, and Deputy Chief Administrative Judge Kaplan. And I said to them that, you know, like, I grew up in these courts, right? So I've seen the good times and the not so good times. And right now we are in very good times. I mean, I appreciate their collaborative leadership style. I appreciate the fact that they listen to the rank and file. I appreciate the fact that they are present, right? Like you see them everywhere, you you know, they're there kind of thing. I mean, uh, first deputy, Chief Administrative Judge uh, Norman St. George sends emails all the time, you know, wishing us, you know, good holidays. Uh, whenever it's like bad weather, he wishes a safe trip home. You know, this is the kind of caring um, leadership that I think we have all been longing for for so long. So I am extremely excited. Um, I can't say enough nice things about Chief Judge Wilson. Uh, I, I kid with him that he's like my big brother. Um, we both have freckles. We both have September birthdays. Um, you know, <laughs> this is a wonderful group of leaders. Uh, Judge Kaplan has been a mentor for me since I was very, very young. She, In fact, she took me to my first uh, bar association event, the Brooklyn Women's Bar Association. It was through her introduction that I got involved in that. And, you know, DCAJ Richardson, the titan of justice, um, is just somebody who I so want to be like, you know, she's an amazing person. Her commitment is unwavering. Um, it's a great group. And, you know, of course, Joe Zayas, our chief administrative judge, is, you know, like a big brother to me. We joke about how I keep following his path, you know, like he was a criminal court judge. I was a criminal court judge. He went to court of claims. I went to court of claims and he got elected supreme. I went elected supreme. So um, he's somebody that I really, really look up to, um, and I'm so excited to see that the first Latino chief administrative judge is Joseph Zayas, who is just such an amazing person, both inside and out. We seem to be in like kind of like our, our Camelot era, where it seems like everything is possible. And I agree, totally. Everything is possible with this group. And they make you believe, you know, they give you hope, they encourage you, like, this is what one wants in, you know, a leadership team. So tell me about your uh, family. Let me turn the focus back on you a little bit. Um, I we were a very tight knit group. Um, I lived in a four apartment building. My we lived on the second floor. My father's older sister lived on the third floor. My mother's younger sister lived on the fourth floor. So. I grew up surrounded by aunts and uncles and cousins. We celebrated the holidays together. Um, they taught us to be very, very, very proud of our culture. So, you know, every holiday was marked by, you know, big Puerto Rican meals, arroz con gandules, pernil, you know, for Christmas, pasteles. Um, we were taken back to Puerto Rico. My cousins and I were taken back to Puerto Rico regularly because they wanted us to, you know, like see our family there. They wanted us to, you know, be in tune with the Puerto Rican culture from that perspective. You know, in Puerto Rico around the holidays, there are barandas, which is like caroling, basically. You go from house to house, you're singing outside the house, you know, and then they serve you some food kind of thing. It sounds like family is very, very important to you. Family is very, very important to me. And finally, a question for the lawyers. What should lawyers know about Justice Joanne D. Quinones? I guess maybe that there's so much more to me than the serious, strict person they see on the bench. I mean, you know, I like to have fun. I'm a practical joker. I'm a social butterfly. Uh, I'm a people person. And maybe like on, on the more serious side, maybe that, you know, I would, I'd like lawyers to know that, you know, I don't expect or demand of them like anything that I would not demand or expect of myself, you know? So I would say like, the three P's are very important to me. You know, be prepared, be punctual and present, and be professional. Mm, I think that's four P's, but you get my drift. <laughs> I do. Well, that's a wonderful <laughs> way to end it. Jess, thank you so much for your time and for your service. 
Thank you so very much.